going to move across now to uh, Nicolette Graham. She's a uh, antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist at the Queensland Children's Hospital here in Brisbane. Um, and she's going to be talking to us about antimicrobial optimization um, from critically ill to in home care of our paediatric patients. So, um, Nicolette. Thank you, Susie, uh, Jason, Luminita, um, for the lovely invitation to our PEDS cohort. Um, and it's a great privilege to present with Tony and Amanda this evening. Um, and welcome everyone to the session. Um, so yes, I've been tasked to talk about paediatrics, not neonates. Um, Amanda is the expert in our neonatal cohort um, as well. Um, but I'm going to focus on critically ill children and um, kind of take a little bit of a tour through a complex case that we had recently to show the application of um, antimicrobial dosing optimization in critically ill children. So as Jason said, this week is Antimicrobial um, Awareness Week. And um, as we know, antimicrobial res resistance is a huge concern um, and a rising um, global threat um, across the world. Um, and here's just some examples of um, quite worrying statistics around um, antimicrobial resistance that we're seeing in the paediatric patient cohort. So for example, um, we're seeing uh, two thirds of cases um, of neonatal sepsis in Sub-Saharan Africa, Africa um, are being caused by um, very resistant bacteria to first line antibiotics. And there's a lot of key research in this area that's um, currently underway. When we think about children and we think about paediatrics, um, we've got a wide spectrum of patients that we're actually dealing with. Um, a lot of developmental changes over time that take place um, and how they respond and handle medicines changes rapidly. And so as um, clinicians, it's really important for us to be aware of those changes when we think about our antibiotics and our antimicrobials, as Tony has alluded to before. And when we think about sepsis, um, we also think about how the disease can impact how that drug handling occurs um, and the exposure. So that target attainment that we want to achieve um, against um, some of these resistant organisms that we're concerned about. So I'm going to use this case study to demonstrate how we could apply um, some of these principles. Um, and hopefully this will be useful for you in your practice. So very recently, we were looking after a young girl, um, four years of age, um, with a diagnosis of severe aplastic anemia. She was currently um, on treatment, so receiving cyclosporin, so immunosuppressed, awaiting her bone marrow transplant. As part of the um, history, um, we noted that she had quite significant um, reactions or hypersensitivity reactions to some key antimicrobials, including Bactrim, Voriconazole and um, peptides. At this point in time, we were asked to provide some advice on her management. Um, she had had a period, prolonged period of neutropenia, more than four weeks. And we noted on her um, microbiology history that she has had several courses of antibiotics for different bloodstream infections, including Klebsiella pneumoniae, Enterococcus faecium, and Enterobacter cloacae. So quite concerned, lots of gram-negative sepsis and some gram-positive sepsis um, with quite resistant organisms. Um, on top of this, she's had some increased oxygen requirements, um, persistent fevers, and some changes seen on chest CT, which um, at the moment would be managed um, as a, a invasive fungal lung infection or presumed. For that, she was receiving ambazone and treatment dose, um, and for her PJP prophylaxis, she'd been on atovaquone. So the call comes through to our infectious diseases team with the history from the oncologist saying that they're really concerned. She's febrile, she's hypotensive, she's got a poor cap refill, and ICU's been asked to consult and come and re review her to see if she needs to be moved to our intensive care unit. We also speak to the immunologist um, on service to think about um, which antibiotics we potentially could start for her. And together as a team, the decision is made to start meropenem, gentamicin and vancomycin. So I guess the question is, how are we gonna approach dosing in this young lad, la lady? And how um, would we apply those principles that Tony has alluded to, um, to really individualize um, care and treatment for this patient? So, 
Jason always loves this slide and, and so I'm borrowing it <laughs> with his permission. Um, but when we think about PKPD and we think about antimicrobial therapeutic drug monitoring and dose optimization, we need to think about the mug, so the patient, the bug, the infection we're treating, the disease state, and also the drugs that we'd be using and how those interplay with each other is really important. So we've got a four-year-old and interestingly enough, she actually weighs 42 kilos as her dry weight. Um, and there were some um, concerns around using standardized dosing for her, given that she was at um, quite a high BMI. She also had low, persistently low albumin um, and quite significant fluid overload at the time that we reviewed her. If we look back over time, she had quite a bit of um, a urine output fluctuations, so concerns about her renal function. And obviously, she's an immunocompromised host. So when we think about sepsis um, for this young patient, there are quite a few factors that may influence our drug exposure um, and um, ability to achieve target attainment. In her case, we're really concerned about capillary leakage and third spacing and the impact that could have on volume distribution of hydrophilic drugs, including aminoglycosides and beta-lactams. She potentially could have altered renal clearance. And what we're not quite sure about at this stage is, does she have renal impairment? Or is that going to fluctuate to augmented renal clearance during the sepsis episode? So we're going to have to reevaluate what we do in terms of dosing and use TDM to support that decision making. We also want to think about what other concomitant um, therapy she's receiving that may be influencing her renal function and how that may be impacting other drugs, including the ambazone that she's receiving at present. She's not currently on renal replacement therapy and doesn't require ECMO at present, but that may be on the cards down the track. So we may need to be quite agile in the way we think about dosing, reloading her and using therapeutic drug monitoring. So this is just a quick snapshot of her albumin over time. And as you can see, persistently hyperalbuminemic. So we're quite concerned about um, her exposure, um, in, in particular with highly protein bound um, agents. We know that this um, persistent hyperalbuminemia could result in um, an increased free or unbound drug concentration. And that may also change our volume distribution and clearance um, for these agents. And so, all in all, there's lots of factors to consider. There is the extreme of weight, there's the organ dysfunction, the hyperalbuminemia, and the fact that she's been colonized with quite resisting organisms. So quite a conundrum. So now we're having a look at drug therapy and um, we're gonna look through and work through the treatment options that um, we are considering um, to come up with some dosing recommendations for our ICU team. And when we think about our antimicrobial um, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic indices, um, we know that there are, um, they are really well described in the literature. There's lots of good um, studies to support um, these PKPD indices and targets that we should be utilizing for our patients. And mainly in the adult cohort, and sometimes we borrow from our adult colleagues, um, but hopefully um, some new research emerging in the pediatric space. So when we look at our antimicrobials, um, we're thinking about drugs that are hydrophilic or lipophilic. We're thinking about our exposure. So this is, you know, is this a concentration dependent or is this a time dependent antimicrobial? Um, how can we optimize the dosing? Do we need to um, give high doses um, and then um, calculate error on the curve or do we need to utilize extended infusions and more frequent dosing um, to achieve better time above MIC? And as part of this, we're also considering the impacts that obesity will have on her clearance and volume distribution. So as with Tony's presentation before, um, our adult colleagues have published some great um, consensus guidelines around what um, clinical effective PKPD targets we should be utilizing with different antibiotic agents and um, classes. And so as shown on the screen, for aminoglycosides, we know that looking at values like CMAX to MIC ratio, as well as AUC over MIC is extremely important to achieve that clinical target attainment. When we think about our beta-lactams and our carbapenems, um, time above MIC, and in particular, achieving at least 50 to 100% time above MIC for each dosing interval is really, really important in our critically ill patients. 
So for meropenem, what did we decide? How did we approach this? And what does the evidence say around pediatrics? So we know that there are some pediatric PKPD studies out there, but um, in our critically ill population, we are still struggling to find good models that really support good dosing and dose optimization in children. If we take a leaf out of our um, adult colleagues um, uh, consensus guideline, we know that um, therapeutic drug monitoring would be extremely important and to help us achieve um, better targets. We also know that we want to optimize time above MIC and so extended or continuous infusions depending on your local practices would be extremely important to consider. So for our patient here, we know that carbapenems would be hydrophilic, we know we've got increased volume distribution and we would have variable clearance um, in this patient group as a result of her critical illness as well as extreme of weight. So in terms of empiric starting dose, we would use actual body weight and in, in her case, we actually select the Q's 40 per kilo IV eight hourly um, and we utilize extended infusions, each dose infused over three hours. So when we look at some um, excellent narrative reviews and systematic reviews that have been published recently, we note that there is a real um, paucity of data um, around some of these um, really important gram-negative agents that we use. And so for meropenem, um, a recent um, narrative review showed there were only five studies published recently that looked at PK in critically ill children. And one of the things they found was that we noted variability in clearance, so renal clearance um, in critically ill children compared to non-critically ill um, children. But we also noted that optimizing your dosing through extended infusions um, or altering your dosing interval would be extremely important. And this is demonstrated nicely by a study by Jeffrey Cleese and his team um, published in 2017, looking at exactly this question. Um, and they found that dosing regimes of 120 to 160 milligram per kilo per day using extended or continuous infusions would achieve um, target attainment of at least 80% um, in patients with critical illness um, in children with gram negative um, sepsis. So gentamicin is bread and butter antibiotics for us um, in pediatrics. And we know that there's good pediatric PKPD data available. So yes, we would definitely utilize therapeutic drug monitoring. We would consider um, obesity as one of the factors where we may need to do a bit of an empiric dose adjustment early on, but we certainly would be optimizing that dose um, using AUC monitoring. And as Tony alluded to, um, there's some great um, Bayesian forecasting tools available with great models um, that can be utilized um, to help improve your um, target attainment for these patients. Likewise, um, at least four um, good pediatric studies that looked at um, PK um, for gentamicin in critically ill children. And we note that initially with high volumes distribution, we often need high initial doses, but we often have to extend the dosing interval in our younger patients. And I'm sure Amanda will allude to this in a, a bit more detail. But we also note that um, factors such as age and weight can be significant predictors. Um, and we need to take that into account. So utilizing Bayesian forecasting does provide us with a lot of surety in terms of dose prediction. So vancomycin, um, definitely important in managing um, early sepsis, especially in patients colonized with MISA, um, and in her case, Enterococcus decium. We um, were quite concerned about how we would dose her given the extremes of weight and her sepsis. Um, and so utilizing error in the curve monitoring would be considered best practice. We know that you're um, more likely to predict better target attainment with AEC monitoring and that you're less likely to have um, significant toxicity if you compare that to some of the trough level targets um, that are utilized based on some of the literature. Um, in her case, we actually utilize actual body weight for our starting dose um, and um, importantly utilize AUC monitoring to optimize her exposure. So moving on to our bug. So in our young patient's journey, she was then admitted to intensive care. Um, at that point in time, she was intubated and ventilated, but didn't require inotropes. So they responded quite well to fluid resuscitation. They were able to drive her urine output using a bit of frisamide and Luckily, she didn't require any continuous renal replacement therapy. 
at the time, the ID team reviewed her microbiology results and decided that vancomycin and gentamicin could be ceased. Um, and the microbiology team pulled through some of the um, worrying but helpful results around um, a, a quite a significant environmental organism that came up on several blood cultures um, as shown on the screen. So stenotrophomonas maltophilia was um, cultured for this patient and it's not something we would generally expect um, in this particular patient cohort, but given her immunocompromised state um, and the unusual range of um, septicemia that we'd seen in her um, treatment course to date, um, it was felt that this was a true result um, and we were targeting uh, antimicrobial therapy to um, the MIC results and sensitivity results. And at the time, the decision was made to actually swap out our meropenem, go across to keptazidine, and then give moxifloxacin intravenously as well. So back to the drawing board, what are we going to do? How are we going to optimise her exposure to these antibiotics? Um, if we look at the literature, there's actually only one recent paediatric PK study available around keptazidine, um, looking at patients who are critically ill in this age cohort. And we know that with keftazidine, we're worried about volume distribution changes and clearance, especially with her obesity. We um, wanted to optimize her dose exposure. So we utilize actual body weight in dose calculations. We also wanted to make sure that she got optimal exposure using extended um, infusions. Um, and we landed on providing her dose that was administered four times a day. And if we look at the study um, that was published by Anil Maharaj and his team um, in 2021, they looked at this in a, in a small but very effective cohort of pediatric patients um, that included a large number of patients at extremes of weight. And they looked at um, keptazidine target attainment and what dosing would be considered optimal. And one of the things that they found was that um, utilizing a dose of 40 milligram per kilo, six hourly, would actually achieve your target attainment levels for more than 90% of the um, time in this patient cohort, as long as your MIC was eight or below. So hopefully we'd optimize your dose sufficiently to clear the bacteremia. So moving on to um, managing her um, bacteremia further with moxifloxacin, Moxifloxacin is not commonly used in pediatrics, but when we use it, we really need to make sure that we provide the right dose exposure. So if we look at our adult colleagues' guidance around fluoroquinolones, we know that um, therapeutic drug monitoring is neither recommended or discouraged. Um, however, in this case, um, given um, the significant variability in PKPD, um, her um, critical illness and this unusual organism, the decision was made to optimize therapy utilizing AUC monitoring. We're very fortunate here in Queensland. Um, we've got an excellent um, HPLC laboratory that's um, been setting up some really novel assays for us. Um, and quite a few years ago now, um, they set up a moxifloxacin assay that we'd be utilizing for some of our cystic fibrosis patients. So we were for fortunate enough to be able to utilize this for our patient and actually get our results back within 24 hours. So moxifloxacin is more lipophilic um, fluoroquinolone. Um, we do see um, impacts um, of increased um, volume distribution, increased clearance in our obese patients with sepsis. Um, in terms of dosing data, there's not a lot of good pediatric dosing data utilizing moxifloxacin. So we extrapolated utilizing 10 milligram per kilo and capped it at 400 milligrams 24 hourly. And as mentioned, you utilize AUC monitoring. So we performed our TDM on um, day three in this case, um, and we utilized a level at two and six hours post-dose. Um, our Cmax values returned at 9.2, and if we think back to our targets, PKPD indices that we're using, um, a Cmax to MIC ratio above eight um, in standard infections, but in more severe MDR infections, we're aiming for um, that ratio above 12. And so we achieved that um, for this patient. In terms of AUC to MIC ratio, um, we definitely achieved that with the target set at above 125 for severe or MDR infections. So the patient improved, we were able to clear the bacteremia and certainly the utility of TDM 
the ability to do novel therapeutic drug monitoring and optimizing dosing throughout her treatment course is extremely important. Um, and um, she survived the sepsis episode and improved and was able to complete her engraftment post her bone marrow transplant and was discharged home. So I'm just changing pace a little bit. Um, and for those in the audience who are cycling enthusiasts, many of you guys may be familiar with Sir David Brailsford. And I thought it really important to actually highlight some of the gaps that we suddenly uh, continue to see in pediatric therapeutic drug monitoring and um, pediatric antimicrobial optimization in terms of the lack of PK and PD studies that we have. And hopefully encourage you guys and inspire a few budding research to think about what you can do to contribute. So Dr. Da uh, Sir David Brailsford um, is um, the now coach um, of um, Team Sky, which is the UK cycling team. And he's known for his theory of the aggregation of marginal gains. So achieving a tiny margin of improvement in everything you do cumulatively over time would improve um, or give significant improvement and help achieve goals. And so what he did was he literally changed every single thing that Team Sky did in terms of their training, their nutrition, um, their travel arrangements, the cycling suits that they wore, um, the nutritional supplements that they took as part of their races. He even got a surgeon to teach them about hand hygiene. And what was really amazing is that he believes that 1% improvement in every single step of what you do will result in a significant increase. So if we break that down and we think about um, therapeutic drug monitoring, antimicrobial optimization and stewardship, there's a lot that we can learn from um, Sir Brailsford. So what was the outcome? So in a 10 year period of time, Sky, Team Sky went from not winning any championships or ever featuring in Tour de France to having more than 178 world championships, 66 um, Olympic and Paralympic gold medals, and five Tour de France victories. Quite an achievement. So when we think about how this applies to what we do, think about clinical research, think about how that meets quality improvement, and how important it is for our multidisciplinary teams um, to collaborate together to address the challenges shown on the right um, in terms of dose optimization in children. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you so much for your time. And, and as um, Susie's mentioned, um, we'll take questions at the end of the session during the Q&A session.